We notice you go through you go through chapters a whole lot faster on the radio than you do in here. <laughs> <laughs> You're already on what, chapter six or seven? Oh, believe it or not, I think we're gonna have to do a review with Daniel before we jump into chapter six. Is that okay? Yeah. You sure. guys are gonna help me out, right? Yes, Pastor. All right. <clears throat> so we're going to quickly do this chart. <clears throat> uh, yeah, we got to have the dates up here. I'll stop at 8. I mean, we could go to 9 and 11, too, couldn't we? Okay, so, <clears throat> Daniel chapter 2, we have the head of gold. Daniel 7, what is the symbol used there? The lion. Daniel 8, what's the symbol used? Oh, a beast. <coughs> there isn't one. What's the meaning? <coughs> Babylon. Babylon and the dates. 605 to 539. Hey, uh, teamwork there. We got stereo teamwork going on. It's <laughs> awesome. Okay. <clears throat> Chest and arms of silver. Bear. Means a bird. Five thirty-nine. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> I love it. What's the next one? The belly and drop. Bronze or brass? Which one? Goat? Leopard. 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 symbols that relate with the legs of iron, don't we? What's the other symbol here? The little horn. The little horn. No, it's... All right. 
But in Daniel 8, it combines the two together in the one symbol, a little horn, but represented by two different entities. What's the other entity? Papal Rome. Papal. Catholic Church system, not the people. Okay, here we go. So 160 year prophecy. 476 is 1798. What's the first part? No, it was five. No, no, it was five something. 538. 538. A.D. in 1798. How many times is that prophecy given in the Bible? Seven. Seven times, right? In the book of Revelation. In, in, uh, when you have them together with Daniel and Revelation. Okay, now, the feet of iron and clay. There was you have ten horns and rings. Is that part of it? Ten nations? Okay. So we could say uh, the ten horns here, right? We really don't see a symbol given here specifically talking about this, do we? Right? I'm going to put nine. And what's the meaning? Divided Europe, and we can say that started in 476 AD and it goes to the present. And then, what's <coughs> next? Stone. Stone is the statue of what does the stone represent? Christ coming. Second time. Okay, so I think we have this principle given in Daniel, don't we, that we have uh, this recapitulation going on. I like that. Yeah, yeah. I thought yeah. you might. Yeah. And so we're given a prophecy where we're given some information about the history of the world all down to the second coming. And in Daniel 7, it's repeated, and we're given a little more detail. In Daniel 8, we're given a little more detail again. And we just kind of summed it up over here to get an idea what the timing is. And so we have the same thing. If if Daniel and Revelation are connected with each other, should we see the same thing going on in the book of Revelation? Right? Does anyone need to take a picture of this? We're going to erase it. Right? Okay. What do you think, Brian? You got it? Okay. So this number, the number there shouldn't be 18476 to 1844? No. No, because uh, the, the Pope was captured in 1798. Okay. So if, if we went into the detailed prophecy of Daniel 8 here, the 2300 year prophecy, if we put that up here, then we would say, uh, <clears throat> we would give those dates, right? Yeah. What, were the, what are the two dates of the the beginning and the ending date of the 2300 year prophecy. 457 to BC to 1840. 1840. 1840. Right. Okay. What do you think, Ryan? You got it? You got it memorized? Because <laughs> well, this will help you understand the book of Revelation. Okay. I'm going to raise it. Here we go. That's the. Uh, we we'll covered the book of Daniel in 10 minutes. <laughs> it beat our last time through. <laughs> okay. So if you notice what's happening here in the book of Revelation, we did Revelation chapter 1, and it was like an introduction, right? And then we did Revelation... Chapters 2 and 3, and then we have the seven churches. And then we do Revelation chapters 4 and 5. And what what did it, what were we looking at in Revelation 4 and 5? The throne. The, throne, the throne room. Okay. Throne room, right? What event was it highlighting? The land is taking this scroll. Okay, so, so notice we have Christ 
entering in five. Inaugurated as our high priest. Because he was worthy, right? Mm -hmm. Uh oh. P R I E. It is? Okay. So we're going to look right there. Is it right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It <clears throat> In the heavenly sanctuary, right? So, what time period does this cover? 1844 to the... To the present. No, actually 31 AD to 1790. How about 31 AD to the second coming? Okay. Right? Do, do you see that here? That chunk in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 is covered in 31 AD when Jesus dies on the cross establishing the church. You know, we have uh, 31 AD until the second coming is covered by those seven churches. It's historical periods of time, right? Wanda, you okay with that? Okay, I want to make sure. Oh, she, she doesn't look comfortable to me, Mark. What do you think? Uh, I don't know. She doesn't look comfortable. She's something's running to her head. Okay. Got the wheels turning? All right. Okay. So then we have this event taking place, right? So what do you think Revelation chapter 6 is going to do? Look at Revelation chapter 7. Let's look ahead and tell me what the end point of what we're going to be studying in Revelation chapter 6 is. What we're trying to do is let the Bible define, up, define to us the timing here so we get an idea of what we're talking about, what the topics are, what the period of time is. It's not the time in 44 hours. The seals. What about verse 14? Oh, what Christ's this, second coming. That's people in heaven, isn't it? So can I say that over here in Revelation chapter 7, we have it ending, right, with people in heaven. How big of a multitude is in verse 14? Unnumbered. So this is after, right, post, second coming. So can we say that Revelation chapter 7 ends with the second coming of the people in heaven. We okay with that? Yes. Okay. So, when did Christ go to heaven? Give me the, the timing of it. He, he dies in 31 AD on the cross, right? How much time did he spend on this earth? 40 days. 40 days. Okay. So, he, he spent the 40 days... And then he ascends to heaven. Ten days later, the day of Pentecost is when this is taking place, right? So ten days later, this happens and the Holy Spirit is poured out. When he's inaugurated as high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, the Holy Spirit is poured out on this earth. Okay? So we're, we're somewhere around 31 AD as the starting point for Revelation chapter 6. And the ending point is the second coming. Are we okay? We're setting these bounds before we look into Revelation chapter 6 because you hear so many different <laughs> interpretations of the four horsemen. You know. Pastor, where do you get the ten days? Ten days later? Uh -huh. The day of Pentecost. Okay. Right? It's 50, 50 days after Christ dies on the cross, so... We know he spent 40 days on the earth, and then he ascended, and 10 days later, so 40 plus 10 gives, gives us the 50. So we know that it was, Pentecost is 50. We know it was 10 days after he went to heaven that Pentecost <clears throat> occurred because it was 50 days. Right, so. right, exactly. I have a question. Yes. The cross was became our high priest. At that time, the 1844, the sanctuary was cleansed. How many years was that? Say it again. How many years was it between the last 10 days there and 1844? What was Christ doing then? 
Okay. When he cleanses. Okay. okay. So between when he ascends and 1844, which starts the Day of Atonement, right? right where is he at in the heavenly sanctuary? The holy place. So the holy place ministry is taking place. So let me, let me sketch that. So we have the pattern that God gave us in the Old Testament of what the heavenly sanctuary looks like, right? So I'm just drawing the tabernacle. And uh, what's on the north side? Showbread. 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 All right. And what is it? What's it? The Father and Son. God the Father and God the Son. So this is representing God's throne, right? Right now. Yeah. So we have God's throne. That's why in... Isaiah chapter 14, the devil says, I want to put my throne on the side of the north. Right? Because it was on the north side of the holy place, right? So this is the holy place. And this is most, the most holy place, right? And what was a cross from? What does this represent? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Okay, we got the Holy Spirit. So we actually have the Trinity here, right? Two, two stacks of bread here. So that's the Father, God the Father. And we have God the Son. We have the Holy Spirit. What was over there? The altar of incense. Altar of incense. Yeah, the prayers. golden altar of incense, right? Prayers. And prayers. Uh, intercession takes place when it comes to prayers, and that's the role of the high priest, right? That's what he's doing in, in the holy place. From 31 A.D. to 1844, he's in this place. In 1844, he goes over here, and then this is until the end of the pre-advent judgment, right? The end of pre-advent judgment. Can I do that? So he's there. <clears throat> so this is where he's at now. But in this particular gap we're talking about, that you asked me about, he's in the holy place, officiating as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary <clears throat> during that period of time. You're still looking at me, Robert. I don't know. Well, I, I don't understand. You know, God is, I mean, he's powerful. He can do a lot of things. Jesus, too. Right. Why did there was so much time in there? What all did he do? What was he doing? When did the investigate judgment? Well, the investigate judgment wasn't taking place here, right? <coughs> it didn't start until 1844. Right, it didn't start until 1844. So, in this particular place, what are they, they're preparing for this, but what is he doing? He's poured out his spirit in 31 AD. Right? And then he has his disciples then going throughout the whole world preaching the gospel. And so he's basically building up his church. And once the church is built up and, and their names are written in the book of life, that's what's used here in the pre advent judgment. So he's preparing for the pre advent judgment by putting giving the names written in the book of life. I've never sense? heard that before. Yeah, does, that, does, make, does that make sense? Got to think about it. I was looking at it and, and trying to. Look at it in the scripture. What who would tell me that in the scripture? Okay. Could we say that God gave us this visual um, more for us to understand his chain, like his role or chain or functions during certain time periods as opposed to like geography, like a change in geography? Does that make sense? It does make sense. We're really looking at the role he, he had here versus what he's doing. But I think the purpose of this ministry, the holy place ministry, if I drew the whole sanctuary, the tabernacle, right? That's where, this is the earthly part of his ministry, right? There are three parts to it. He, dies on the, he comes to this earth, he dies on the cross for our sins. That is represented, you know, by the lamb being slain and put on the altar of burnt offering. That all happens out here, right? And then uh, you can take the blood into... The Holy Brothers. <laughs> See, the beautiful thing about Christ's ministry in heaven is um, he dies on the cross on earth, but unless the blood's applied, it doesn't do any good on our behalf. The blood's got to be applied. And that's what the sanctuary teaches us. 
And that's what he's doing in this phase. He's applying the blood. So what, what do we do? We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That's 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. What does verse 7 say that he cleanses us with? His blood. His blood. Right? And so he's doing that, and he's building up his church here. You know what's interesting about this? Have you noticed this? This, I, I love this in Matthew chapter 18. when Jesus asked him, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And notice, notice Jesus' response here. Somebody read 17 and 19 there in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus answered and said to him, <coughs> Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father is in heaven. I, I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So it says, the gates of what? Hades. Hades. What's the saying of King James, uh, Scott? Hell. Hell. Okay. So it says, the gates of hell shall not prevail. <clears throat> what is this implying about Christ's kingdom? I won't die. Well, okay, it won't die, but even better than that. It'll thrive. It'll thrive. That means it'll grow. So if I'm in a fortified city, and I have an enemy outside, and he's trying to get into the city through the gate, because typically the gate is the, uh, the weakest point of the wall, right? And Jesus says the gates of hell won't prevail against his church. So what's the church doing? The church is attacking the city. You see that? The city is the, the devil and his kingdom, right? It's lost souls, you see. And Jesus says, well, the gates of Hades or the gates that the devil has put up to keep the gospel out isn't going to prevail with the church. The church is militant, you see. The church is going forward with the gospel. And that's what we read about in Revelation chapter 6. The Holy Spirit is convicting people. As you go out and you share the gospel, the Holy Spirit is convicting that person's heart, right? Now, there is a difference between Hades and hell, though, isn't it? Well, not in this case. Not in this case. Right? It, you know, there's there are three different words for hell given to us in the Greek, right? And the King James says hell for all of them. <laughs> You know, and that's unfortunate because uh, the old grave, grave, right? Yeah, most of the time it's the grave, right? It's it's the grave, and so what's interesting here is the gospel. And that's what's happening right here. Okay, the gospel is being preached to all the world, so Christ can enlarge His kingdom, and the devil trying to prevent that isn't going to be successful. That's what he's saying here in that verse. Wow, I always had it backwards. Yeah, yeah, you would think it's the gates of the kingdom, right? But no, it's the gates of hell that are trying to keep the gospel out. But Jesus says, it's not going to prevail. We're going to break through. Isn't that cool? Yeah, isn't that cool? Christ is the victor. Now, so let's go to Revelation chapter 6. And we're talking about this phase of his uh, heavenly ministry. Okay? Notice in Revelation chapter 6, we're going to start there in verse 1. Now, now you notice how we define the boundaries of Revelation 6. It's, it's, it's covering the same, recapitulating Revelation 2 and 3. It's covering the same time frame, right? We see the boundaries there. Isn't that cool how we're given the boundaries? So it's hard for us to go wrong when we got the boundaries, right? We have him in Revelation 4 and 5, inaugurated as high priest, that was 31 AD. 
And then Revelation chapter 7, we have uh, the second coming happening and people in heaven. So that means Revelation 6 has got to be the period of time in between the two. So that's what we're looking at here. And this is the gates of hell not prevailing against the gospel is what we're talking about. Notice, if I can have somebody, let's see, Bill. Um, you, you have the uh, NIV? Okay, all right. <laughs> How did I know that? That's right. <laughs> I, I, I bet my time on that one, Bill. I'll run my Well, let's hear the NIV in, in verses 1 and 2. I watched that the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come! I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown. And he rode out as a conqueror, bent on conquest. This is the gospel conquering the world. This world was the devil's kingdom, right? He deceived Adam and Eve. Uh, they bought into his deception. As a result of that, Adam kind of sold his birthright as being head of the human race to Lucifer, didn't he? Mm. So whenever the sons of God came together and met in this, in, in this uh, where all the uh, representatives of the unfallen world come together, right? Who's representing earth? Satan. Unfortunately, it's Satan, right? Because Adam sold his birthright. <clears throat> so, here's the question. I want to make sure everybody's okay with what I just said there. Can I go down a rabbit trail? Is that okay? Uh -huh. like rabbit trail. Okay, let's go down. Just... How do we show there's other beings in other worlds from the Bible? How do we? Job. Job, yeah. How do okay. we show? All right, let's go to Job. Job chapter one. Well, let's 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 read what it says there. <clears throat> the sons of God. you thinking about, sir, in Job chapter 1? 6. Oh, okay, let's read it. Would you read it for us? You got it? Yeah. Okay. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro into the earth and from walking up and down in it. Okay, so you're applying sons of God there, maybe because I said it, right, as, as applying to uh, beings of other worlds, but it doesn't really say that in the text, does it? No. You know, other people interpret that as angels. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, first of all... It could be either, right? Uh, you know, it could be either, right? Could maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's talking about both. Okay. I'm, I'm asking, I'm not telling. <laughs> not, not clear what it means, right? right? Okay, so let's look at it this way. Uh, who is the representative of earth? In this case, it's Satan. Okay, look at John chapter 12, verse 31. What does Jesus say there? What does the Bible say? What is it teaching us in John 12, verse 31? Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. All right. And who's the ruler of this world? Satan. He's who's he talking about? Satan. Satan. You see that? All right. Do we want to do Luke 4, 6 just for the fun of it? John 12, 31. Luke 4, 6. Yes. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. What's he saying? That he has authority on He's claiming the world. He's claiming the world, isn't he? Okay. So, we see, I think we can back up this idea that Satan is representing the earth, okay, in this meeting. So wouldn't you assume that these other sons of God are beings representing other worlds who haven't fallen? Right. Is that a good assumption? Right. Okay. 
Okay, I'm seeing a few heads going like this. A few heads are going like this. Okay, so let's see if we can back it up. Ephesians chapter 3. So Ephesians chapter 3, it starts in verse 8, and it's a long sentence. Sometimes Paul has long sentences. How many times did Paul use a period in any of his epistles? Seldom. <laughs> We don't know because it's not. Oh, that's right, zero. <laughs> zero. Well, we don't know because they didn't put the periods in. That's what I'm saying. Way. He didn't use any periods because they didn't use periods in, right? Yeah. And they wrote it at, at, in unchoked Greek, right? All capital letters, all written together, right? It's so, an efficient way to use paper. So it's sort of like a code. It's kind of like a code. <laughs> I mean, if I, if I wrote four... God so love. I mean, this is what they saw the, in their own in Greek, the world. There was no spacing. And like our U.S. No spacing, no punctuation. No spacing, no punctuation. It was all capital letters. Okay. Until, until Greek. Okay. And so it saves paper because paper was uh, a commodity, right? It wasn't something that's <clears throat> mass produced like it is today. So. In Ephesians chapter 3, it starts in verse 8 and goes to verse 12. But, but what I want to focus on is what it says in verse 10. Okay? <laughs> so let's read 8 to 12, and then we're going to come back and focus on verse 10. So who, who wants to read uh, those verses for us? Let me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord and whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. But Bill, help us out. Read verse 10 in the NIV and compare that with what you just read, Gina. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Does that make sense? Isn't it? I mean, when I heard of the King James, I struggled a little bit, right? But, but read it one more time, Bill, so we can absorb it. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. So, God is using the church in this world to, to show his wisdom, right, to other worlds. Can I, is, is that a good interpretation or my own uh, version of that? Did everybody get that out of that? Okay. So we have beings in other worlds that's watching to see the, this, the great controversy um, uh, being accomplished here and coming to its conclusion and seeing the gospel going throughout the world and seeing the manifold wisdom of God. Okay. Are we okay with that? So. It, Pastor, wasn't it to prove his innocence of what Satan had accused him of? You know what she just said? You know what she said, baby? She just got through saying, God's on trial. Isn't that what you said? Yes, that's true. It is true. Okay. Yeah, give me a verse. Just, just not all at once. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say Romans? Yeah, I'm sure that. Yeah, yeah. What chapter? <laughs> Three. Three. Excellent. And, and what verse? Four. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> What's it say there in Romans 3 4? This is a pretty good verse. I like this verse. Nobody's reading this. I'm wondering if. Certainly not. Okay. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. Who's being judged? God. God's being judged. Do you see that? God's on trial, but Lucifer has stood up 
and accused him before all these leaders of all these in the world and, and made these false accusations about God. So God is utilizing what's happening on this world to show that these are false accusations. I know it's hard to understand, but these beings in these other worlds have never heard a lie. Before Lucifer, remember what does it say in John 8, 44? Satan's the father of lies. He, he began, he started it, you see. Nobody had ever heard a lie before. It never had happened. Right? And so he gets up and he starts saying these things about God. And they're going, what? What? You know? What, what's he saying? My mind's blown here. That makes right? me want to give Eve just a little grace. You know, Eve, Eve you know. She was deceived. She was. The problem is. I mean, if she'd never heard a lie, it's hard to know the difference. I don't want, but she was warned. They were warned. That's God, true. God sent That's angels, why I said a little grace. Her. Yeah. <laughs> and she needs grace. We all need grace. Yeah. But the thing about Eve, the big, the big problem, the big, where, where she started her her problem, is she left her husband's side. That's right. right. Now, I mean, the Adam is partly to blame. He said, "I'm looking for her." That's right. right. You know. So I think both of them are to blame here, but. You notice what the Bible says. Sin did not enter the human race through Eve. No. Sin entered the human race through Adam. Yeah. What does it say that pastor? <laughs> I'm just going to throw it back at him. <laughs> All right. I want that text. <laughs> so, he's on trial. She wants a text. Let's go. First uh, Timothy chapter 2, verse 14. Matter of fact, let's read 13 and 14. And I don't like these verses, but it's the truth, right? I don't like what it says, but unfortunately, it's the truth. What's it say? What, Timothy what? Second, I mean, First Timothy chapter two, verse. You know, I forgot to turn that on today, so I don't know. If that's going to be a problem. Well, it's it's only a problem for people on that's trying to watch it on Zoom. Well, okay. Well, I'm going to blame it on Bill Covey. <laughs> 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 Right I was thinking why, I was wondering a while ago if you had it on because I never it, heard it, was, it say. It was totally my fault. I just totally got Oh, it. I'm recording it. So okay. I, this is this is what I put on. Yeah, I, on I guess YouTube we'll have anyway. a we'll have a blind area there for uh, people who want to watch the sign of school. Do you upload this one? <coughs> no, I, I I get it all right here. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's what I put on YouTube. What's it say? Now, Wanda, are you okay with this, these two verses? First Timothy, Timothy 2, 13 and 14, we're trying to show the sin of the human race through Adam. She wanted a passage. Let's see if we can satisfy Well, it just says he was, Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived. Okay, so Adam, Adam chose, right? Yeah. Adam willfully rebelled against God, knowing, right? Yeah. It says, was not deceived. 2 Corinthians 11.3, what does it say? Was that the right there, Second Corinthians 11. Yes. But I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So, so notice, the Bible clearly says Eve was deceived, but it clearly says Adam wasn't. That's why sin entered the human race through Adam, because... Um, he chose. He chose to rebel. So he, Christ had to choose not to in order to be a Adam to correct it. Yeah, well, we, we, you could read in Romans 5 about the two Adams, right? Because you got uh, the first Adam, sin, and it, it, it emphasizes this idea in Romans 5, sin entering the human race through the first Adam. So you had to have the second Adam in order to take, uh, you know, to eliminate the issue, the problem of the first Adam. Right? Romans chapter 5. I think that's what it talks about. So, we we have, now, back to what we're talking about in uh, that in Revelation chapter 6, we have this, this first horse and rider representing the gospel conquering, doesn't it say that? What, it uses two words. It says, conquer, and, you wrote it as a conqueror bent on conquest. 
Okay, all right. Your assist kind of class there. Conquer and, and to conquer. Okay, so the inspired version says conquer. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Bill. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm glad you're bringing it on me. <laughs> because it was really clear in Ephesians 3.10, wasn't it? So, I think we see that it's representing what, what Jesus talked about in Matthew 16 when he said, the gates of hell will not prevail, right? We have this first rider who's on a white horse. And notice, notice what he has there. This, this is pretty cool. Look at the description. What's on his head? A crown. Okay. So you all, you, you got to use your blue letter Bibles here because... I want, there's two different crowns in the Greek, right? There's diadem, which means royalty, and there's stephanos, which means victory. So which crown is it here? Stephanos. Stephanos. Yeah, yeah. That's right. In the, the Greek victor, it's the <coughs> Yeah, exactly. So we have stephanos going on here. I looked and behold, a white horse. What does white represent in the Bible? Purity. Purity. The white horse symbols warfare. Okay. Horses in the Bible almost always are associated with warfare. We have a great controversy. There's a war going on between Christ and Satan. He started it. Christ is going to end it. Okay? All right, so I like that. Horses associated with warfare. Remember, the kings of Israel and Judah were not supposed to ride on horses. They weren't supposed to own horses. Shame on Solomon, right? Yeah. They were supposed to ride on donkeys. Didn't know what Jesus rode on? He rode on a donkey, didn't he? Right. Because what happened is, they put their trust in the horses. Right? They look how powerful I am. I'm on this powerful beast. Nobody can conquer me. And so God said, okay, don't be riding horses. Right? I want you to put your trust in me, is what God said. Not in your weapons of warfare. So what? Right? So horses... Symbolize humility? For yeah, them. exactly. So... And what a faith and trust in God, too. You know, it's not you that, that's conquering. It's really God conquering through you, right? Who conquers the sin in you? Well, Christ does. I mean, I'm too weak to fight against sin. I'm not smart enough to fight against sin. I mean, that's the bottom line. But with the Word of God, Satan doesn't have a chance, right? With this, I can gain the victory. But it's not because of my wisdom, it's because I put my trust in what the Word of God says, claim the promises, and uh, God intervenes. So we, a horse associated with uh, warfare, what, uh, what about white? What did somebody say about white? Purity. 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 Okay, I, I like righteousness. Purity. Purity and righteousness. Okay, I, I love it. I mean, to me, I believe it, and it, it, it's logical. But I'm thinking, what's a good verse to bring up to show that white means purity? I like that. Okay. So Bill just brought up Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. That's excellent. Okay. Uh, what about uh, Revelation 19.8? I, I like Revelation 19. And, and there is a cool thing going on here in Revelation chapter 19. But would you read verse 8? And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. I love that. Isn't that great? Fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. It doesn't use the word white, right? Yeah. Oh, does it? Yeah. Uh, fine linen, clean and white. There you go. Okay. Mine says clean and bright. Yours is bright. His is white. Okay. <laughs> Right. He's using the King James, and you have the New King James, right? Yeah. Okay, I got you. So notice the difference there, bright and white. And what it means is it's so white, it's bright. It's bright right? white. Yeah, exactly. Well, the, the interlinear says that Lampros means white. Okay. So, um, we read Revelation 7, 14. Did we not notice that it said, it said white there? Didn't we read that? We talked about, uh, you know... They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the That's it. That's it. Washed their robes and made them white. Yeah, it goes along with 19 doesn't it? Yeah. I think we could write it in our Bibles, you know. Next to 714, you can write 19 because they kind of say the same thing there. So I think we can show pretty clearly that white is representing purity or being clean. 
uh, isn't that wonderful we have that opportunity to be able to do this? Uh, I'm tempted to say Daniel chapter 12 verse 10 too. Uh, let's see what that says. It's kind of cool to be able to bring it, bring it from both the Old and the New Testament. You know, they have the same uh, story. Okay. Many shall be purified, made white, and refined. I want to be one of them. How about you? Amen. Amen. You know, the only way to this to happen is, that's what Jesus is doing in the heavenly sanctuary for us. He's cleansing us of our sin. We confess, we forsake. He gives us the desire to confess and forsake. He gives us repentance. Um, he does the cleansing. He makes us white. He changes us. It's all centered on what Christ can do, not what I can do. Right? We have to put our trust fully in Jesus here. So, We've got white, and we've got horse, uh, and it said, he who sat on it had a bow. Now, this is pretty cool. What do you do with a bow? Shoot arrows. No, wait a second. This isn't like uh, a bow and a present? <laughs> no. Oh, this isn't like a bow tie? <clears throat> you shoot arrows with it. It's a battle bow, right? It's like this, right? For promoting Jesus' work. Okay. So let's, let's look at, what's it shooting? Not fiery arrows from the devil. <clears throat> Not those type of arrows, is it? Opposite. It's, using, it's shooting arrows, right? A bow shoots arrows. Okay. All right. What does an arrow do? Penetrates. Okay. Penetrates, pierces, right? And typically, when when you're shooting an arrow at an enemy, what are you aiming for? Vitals. The heart. <laughs> Notice this. Look in... Um, what I'm going to do is I'm equating bow with an arrow and the word of God. Okay, that's what I'm trying to do. But let's, notice what it says. Let's go to Acts chapter 2, verses 36 and 37. I think this is all we have time for. Oh, we're, we're, in a, we're more in the middle of this part. Oh, uh, there we go. <clears throat> Acts 5, 33 and Acts 7, 54. Let's look those passages up pretty quickly because we're running out of time. 36 and 37 say, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for surely that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What did the words do? Cut, cut to, the to the heart. Cut to the heart. Just like what an arrow does. You see that? What about Acts chapter 5 verse 33? And they heard that they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. Wow. So in that particular case, they, even though they were cut to the heart, convicted by the words, they decided they would harden their hearts, right? I'm just okay. so serious. Acts 7, verse 54. And they heard that they were cut to the heart and gnashed him with their teeth. They stopped their ears too. Do you notice that? Stephen gave the sermon. They were cut to the heart by the words, right? And then they stopped with their ears and gnashed their teeth and then they took him out and stoned. They literally covered their ears. They literally covered their ears. Right. You ever somebody, la, 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 don't tell me, don't tell me, I don't want to be responsible. La, 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 la. You ever had that? I had that have to be before. Yeah. I said, look, you're responsible for the opportunity, right? So you might as well go ahead and hear it. So do you see how the words that I believe inspire the Holy Spirit is touching their hearts? Power. Cutting them, right? The cutting two-edged them sword. Yeah. We see the Word of God is described as a two-edged sword. I think it's also going to be equated with an arrow that cuts to the heart, right? So, back in Revelation chapter 6, when it says a bow, I really associate this with the Word of God. He's going out conquering. Well, he's not literally slaying people physically. He's <clears throat> cutting to the heart, right? He's using the Word of God to penetrate the stone-hardened heart and sin so that they can be converted. Praise the Lord. I'm glad he cut me to the heart. How about you guys? Right? Yeah, I'm glad about that. Uh, Acts of the Apostles, page uh, 645. Words of the Apostles are sharp arrows. Uh, Desire of Ages, page 225. Arrows of Truth. 
Pierce the soul. Desire of Ages 697, Christ's words are sharp arrows of the Almighty. So I just think it's interesting how she uses the same type of terminology there. Notice is always in the heart. What does Psalms 45, 1 to 5 say? And that'll probably be the last passage of the day. Psalm 45, 1 to 5. <coughs> Forty-five. Yes. My heart is overflowing with a good theme. I recite my composition, conquering the king, uh, concerning the king. My tongue is a pen. Wait a minute. Did you say forty-five, one, three, five? Uh huh. My tongue is the is the pen of a ready writer. You are fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword upon your thigh, O mighty one, with your glory and your majesty, and in your majesty ride prosperity, prosperously because of truth, humility, and righteousness. And your right hand shall teach you awesome things. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. The people fall under you. We are born an enemy to God, right? We're born with a carnal heart. The Bible says in Romans 8, verse 7, that's at war with God. So, as his words of truth penetrate our sin-hardened hearts, right, we can now, we can then be converted. And that's, I think, he's talking about in Psalms 45, 1 to 5. Isn't that a beautiful passage? Yeah, I think it's great. So, be, kind of contemplate that over the Sabbath here and think about some of the wonderful things that are in there. Father in heaven, we do pray that you cut us to the heart. Help us confess and forsake our sins. Help us know you and love you and live for you. Thank you for this opportunity. Fill us with your spirit now and give us the strength to be the men and women of God you've called us to be. In Jesus' name we put our trust and pray. Thank you. Thanks for coming today. You won't be here next time. I won't be here.